uh, from the perspective of someone who has uh, ADA. Uh, so if I have ADA uh, I, and I'm choosing a pool, I want to I want to choose the pool uh, where I'm going to get the most rewards. Uh, and the amount of rewards I get depends on a few things. Uh, so uh, this depends on the the parameters that the the pool is configured with, right? Um, and this depends on how much uh, stake people have delegated to the pool. Uh, and uh, this also depends on how many blocks the pool uh, actually produces. Uh, so the, the pool parameters, those are like basically just published. So, you know, their, their impact is just a calculation. The, the stake is like, you know, there's a stake that you have right now, but maybe you think it'll change in the future, and then you know, there's like the social factor there. Um, and the, this last one, this is the one I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so the, the blocks produced, uh, we can calculate like how many blocks a pool is allowed to produce, like the, the rate of, of uh, having permission, uh, but like the number of blocks they really produced is based on some other factors, say may, maybe they're running a node from a data center, or may, maybe they're running a node from their living room, uh, and you know maybe they have really good internet, or maybe it's bad internet. So, so like there's stuff that uh, affects this. Uh, so uh, we want some way of guessing uh, how and what proportion of the blocks they're allowed to produce they're really going to produce. Um, and in doing this, uh, we run into like we run into something of an old problem, uh, and we can demonstrate this with a quick example. So let's say there are two pools. So there's Alice's pool, and you know, we're looking at the history, uh, we, we we decide that uh, Alice has been allowed to produce one thousand blocks, and of those, this pool has produced 600 blocks. And then compare, we have Bob's pool. Bob's pool, we think, has been allowed to produce three blocks. And it has really produced two blocks. Um, so there's a question of which of these pools do I think is better. Uh, so I see. 60% for Alice, 66 and change percent for Bob. So from that perspective, Bob looks a little better. But also with Alice, you know, I have a lot of history, and I, 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 I am pretty confident in that 60% with Bob. Like, who knows? Um, so this is this is an old uh, problem on the internet uh, that we saw a lot uh, in like in. Uh, Sorting by rating, uh, either like comment rating or product rating or whatever, where you sort by rating and there, there's something with you know four stars with a thousand reviews. But if you sort by exact average, then you have these five star ratings with one review that, that sometimes came out ahead of it. Uh, right. Uh, so the point, the point is that. Um, Although Bob has a higher percentage rate, Alex, uh, if he misses one block, he, his rate goes down way down, right? Whereas if oh, so, uh, the, on the one hand, there is the, yeah, the, the sensitivity there, but on the other hand, the like one it's subject to change. Like it, from Bob's perspective, it's like precarious, but from my perspective, as someone who's delegating, that doesn't really mean anything. Can I mention one other <clears throat> interesting fact in our scenario is with Preos, I know how many blocks I'm allowed to make, but I have no idea how many blocks everyone else is allowed to make. I can only guess with probability based on their stake what their odds are each slot, but I don't actually know for sure. Oh, you're getting there? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, awesome. that's related. I, mean, I, I, I want to willfully ignore that for less, at least a moment. Right on, right on. Uh, so, uh, so there's an old solution to this problem. Uh, so uh, there's this uh, article, how not, oh, 
how not to sort by average rating, uh, which which talks about this a bit and you know the subtraction and average and the the immediately intuitive things more or less don't work. Uh, but there is a fairly uh, popular now approach that does work, um, which is this Wilson score interval. Wilson score. Um, and the idea is that uh, you have this estimate of probability of block production. And this estimate has a specificity attached to it. So you could have the high specificity estimate or a, a low specificity estimate. And uh, based on this, you can make a confidence interval where I like, you know, I'm 95% confident that you know the, the real rate is between these two values. And you can you can make confidence intervals for whatever level you want. Um, so to, to, to if you don't mind me interrupting, is everyone happy with the idea of confidence intervals and specificity, or does someone want Alex to explain those? So the confidence interval is, yeah, OK, please, please explain them, Alex. Uh, so sure. Uh, so if I have, uh, let's see. Uh, so I have uh, a probability distribution. And let's say it goes something like, uh, like this. I have some kind of shape here. Uh, and so the probabilities all add up to 1. And for each, so one, one is 100%. Yeah, 100%. And for all the values in, in between, I can ask, you know, I can select some range here and ask, what's the probability that we fall inside these range, inside this range? Uh, so a confidence interval, uh, so a 95% confidence interval is a range where I'm 95% sure that my value is going to lie inside that range. Um, so if you have, for example, uh, some kind of uh, loaded dice, and this was a histogram of all of the die rolls, so maybe one is you know the low value is really rare, the high value is really rare, and the you know you, you see the ones in between a lot more. Um, so if you were rolling two dice and added them up, you would see more or less this kind of shape. Uh, so one, once you have your data, uh, you don't really need to know like some physical measurement how the die really works. You can just use the data and say, okay, well you know a lot of the time I saw these numbers, so I can say pretty confidently that I'm going to get one of these numbers most of the time. Um, any questions about that kind of thing? So, and you mentioned specificity as well, Alex. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so the idea with specificity, uh, so this is one possible uh, shape of a histogram. So when we have this kind of data, you know, this doesn't really tell us for sure what we're going to get. But if we had a similar picture that looked more like this, Uh, where you know, we, we very rarely had numbers other than that one, uh, then that makes us pretty sure like we, we can get a fairly narrow range uh, 
and say that, you know, here 95% of the time would give us a pretty big range of what kind of things we expect. And down here, 95% gives us a very narrow range of what kind of things we expect. So it would look more like this. Um, so we'd say that this data, you know, gives us more specificity. So this is a, a, a more accurate, a more constraining estimate. So you're more likely to get some values with second distribution than you are with the first one. Is that another way to say that? Um, sure. These, these 29s are more likely to happen. Uh, so uh, often this kind of thing is handled by just getting more data. So if you get more data, you can be more precise in your estimates. And with less data, you know, you're less precise in your estimates. And this Wilson score uh, is uh, a way of calculating which respects that dynamic. Um, so, uh, so this is this is a this is a, this is a popular approach to, to this problem. So this is used in, in various sorting systems where they use they calculate the you know, will, the the lower bound of the Wilson score and say, okay, we're we're like ninety five percent sure that the the real proportion is above this this bound, and then they they use that lower bound uh, as the the value for their for their rating. Um, so this doesn't. This as is doesn't work for us uh, for exactly the reason that Jared brought up earlier, uh, which is this number, this 1,000. Uh, Alice knows this 1,000, but I don't know that 1,000. Uh, and Bob knows this three, but I don't know this three. So uh, whether or not Alice is allowed to produce a block is only known to her, never to me. Uh, so. I can just calculate the chance that she will be allowed to produce a block uh, on a on a given slot. Um, so to do that, to to handle that, we need to adapt uh, this system uh, to us. So the the math is going to be a little different, um, and I want to go into that in a little bit. Uh, so. This uh, Wilson score interval uh, is an approximation. Uh, and the thing it's approximating is uh, maintaining a probability distribution of what proportion of the time we think uh, a given pool produces its blocks. And uh, every, every time we get new data, uh, we, we calculate a slightly different probability distribution uh, using our new data. Uh, so this is called a posterior distribution. Uh, and uh, the, the new data we get uh, produces something based on our model uh, called a likelihood function. And this is something that we multiply pointwise by our distribution, and then we scale it to get our posterior distribution. So for this simple model for, uh, say, voting on comments on Reddit or something, uh, then our likelihood function looks like this. We have x to the n times 1 minus x to the n, uh, where n is number of times rated as good, and m is number of times rated as bad. Um, so the, the way we would use this is we get our collection of pluses and minuses, uh, and then we take our estimate that we had, we would multiply the fu that function by this function pointwise, and then we'd rescale it to make another probability distribution that would give us another estimate. 
Uh, and for us, uh, so in our model, we have a different likelihood function. So we have Px uh, raised to the n times 1 minus Tx raised to the n. So uh, n is the slots on which a block is produced. And is slots on which a block is not produced and t is the chance that a that this pool is allowed to produce a block. Um, so because uh, we don't have the same likelihood function, uh, our, our our arithmetic doesn't cancel out quite as nicely, and this same approximation doesn't work. Uh, so rather than using that approximation, uh, our plan is to uh, explicitly record uh, the, the probability distribution. So we'll just maintain some picture like this using a bunch of numbers. Maybe it looks more like a thing for a pool. But most of them are going to produce blocks most of the time. Right? Uh, so we maintain a picture that looks kind of like this. And after every, say, after every epoch, we count these things. We calculate this function. We, we multiply by this. And we get a posterior distribution. And that gives us a new picture. Um, so what, what does this actually mean uh, to me as a pool operator, Alex? Uh, so what it means as a pool operator is that uh, when you produce blocks, you look good. And when you don't produce blocks, you don't look as good. Very <clears throat> good question, right? <laughs> and this uh, is going to directly impact your rating in Daedalus. Yeah. Your ranking. Ah, so I, re I really care about this. It wasn't such yeah. a tough question. Indeed. Uh, so this 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 estimate uh, so it actually turned this into a rating in Daedalus. Like we can't really use this picture itself as as the as as an input to the ranking because it's not a single number. We want ultimately to put an ordering on these things uh, and to do that. We we do want a single number from this. Uh, so there there. Are, uh, different things that need to be used as inputs to get a number out of it. Uh, so uh, one of them is, so like, like in the previous Wilson score method, there is the, this confidence bound. Uh, so we could, so we have this confidence bound. Uh, and so for that, we could use the same as Reddit for example, and say 95% lower bound. So you know, we're going to use the number where we're 95% sure that the number is at least this good. Uh, or you could use whatever other bound. You could use an upper bound. So there are options there. Uh, another thing that would affect this is a starting assumption. Uh, so the, the arithmetic here doesn't actually tell us how to get this very first estimate. Uh, it just tells us how to turn uh, one estimate into another slightly better estimate. Um, so a starting assumption to use as input could be something like, you know, we're going to assume that our pools generally behave the same as all the other pools. Uh, or maybe, you know, an individual user is super confident, and their starting assumption is going to be that pools generally produce blocks almost all the time. Um, so there's there's wiggle room to to configure this. Uh, so the the plan for now 
uh, for these assumptions is to just pick uh, reasonable defaults and then eventually let people override them. Uh, so I actually have no clue what reasonable defaults are uh, for the starting assumptions uh, for these things. So. I, I think Umed's right. I, I think that is our plan is to use um, the expectate the use the expected value for the first one, and then with history, go from there. Uh, so that that means everyone starts on the same footing, Jared, or the expected value the same for everyone, or is it somehow different for well, everyone? Before you've done anything, we can assume that you are making the number of blocks or. Uh, your stake would indicate, and then adjust in the way Alex is talking about by combining these histograms epoch by epoch. But obviously, the variance is way high at this point, and that's what this thing does awesome. And this is this, maybe this is what Alex is talking about for um, defaults. So you, we're going to have to make some in order to actually rank them in Daedalus. We're going to have to make some executive decisions and say we're going to pick, you know, this ninety-five, blah blah blah. But ultimately, there's enough data there to where people could pick their own risk profile and say, I'm willing to be a little more risky on pools that have a high variance. You know, there's all this configuration you could do, and the data will all be there. But we'll make some decisions for Daedalus initially and then give the power to the users later to make their own toggleable choice. Uh, one, one example of like the starting assumption is you could have like a very narrow uh, starting assumption uh, where you're, you're really sure that almost all the pools are going to produce at this rate, or you could have a more relaxed starting assumption where uh, it is more susceptible to, to variance, where you know, the, in, the initial pools you know, getting or missing a, a few blocks causes their ranking to swing. And whether that happens or not depends on uh, this, this input. Yeah, Jared, you're nodding, but you're not, not hearing it. So, so some, asking about, um, are we going to test this out on testnet? We would love to. We would love to do it on the. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's not all in place yet. Um, we would love to do it as soon as we get the chance. It might be next week that we uh, get the data in the chain state to where we could expose it, but. Yeah, we should be testing it when we have the Daedalus with the fully public test net. Yeah, it hasn't been the highest priority, but it's you know quickly bubbling up to be. So it's very important to get the rankings right in the wallet. Uh, average Daedalus. Oh, that, that's a good question. That's what I was trying to allude to, Umed. Um, no. We don't expect them to understand this. And that's what I, when I was saying executive decisions, that's what I was saying. Daedalus is going to have to say, I'm going to interpret these histograms in this way. You know, we, we, Daedalus makes that decision and it gives that. Over time, we would have the option of having some toggle, like how risky are you? I, I don't have solutions to this, but we could. There's enough, there's enough toggles there to where we could give users the ability to try to adjust that score. But... Um, we're, no, we're not assuming that they understand how to read these histograms. Uh, so on the, from the perspective of uh, having one standard confidence interval, uh, so at some point, there are going to be really clever users who like, want to properly delegate their, their stake and are super opinionated on how they decide which pool is better than another. Uh, so I'd like to enable them to to make reasonable decisions if they want to. But I expect most people would just use whatever is the default. Probably. Of course, this is a great thing to have input from you guys on as to, you know, it'd have to be a group decision as to what is the best thing to give the public who doesn't want to understand anymore. Definitely, even like when I'm on Amazon and my wife and I are picking out some product, you know, 
she'll say, oh, I want this one. It has a lower ranking and it, ha it has, but it has, a, it has a 12 billion purchases. And I'm like, nah, I'm a little risky. I, I like those two, st those two five star reviews. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so there's a question about massaging the, the um, ma massaging the parameters by being clever with your pool, Jared and Alex. Is this something you want to address? I think it's probably. Uh, yeah. So the, uh, at least for me, the main motivation between behind making it configurable is that it's hard yeah. to massage uh, your numbers if you don't know how people are going to choose their own rankings, because different people are going to have different risk profiles and these risk profiles are going to are going to be different uh, depending on how pools behave. So if a lot of pools are for whatever reason gaming things and you know behaving uh, so you could have a 99% confidence interval. So the, the, the question is like whether should we should it impose the same confidence interval on on everyone, right? And and once you do that, then you have something that's way easier to gain. Uh, that, that's it. That's interesting. You th think intuitively, Alex, that fixing you know, fixing some confidence interval would make it easier for me as a user. It would make it harder to gain, not easier. So it makes it harder. Fixing a confidence interval makes it harder for. Uh, it makes it easier for pool operators to game, I think. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. How does that work? So, like, if, if if everyone knows exactly how, like, if you can calculate exactly how your ranking will go up or go down compared to other pools from the perspective of a user, then that gives you a, an exact formula for how to behave in order to look good, which may or may you know, which could potentially diverge from how to behave well. But if all of the users are picking their own rankings based on their own needs, then this, this forces behavior to converge on meeting the needs. Right. So what we're imagining is the, there'll be a slider or something in the wallet uh, that's related to some risk factor. So I'm, you know, I, I am Richard Branson with a million dollars, and I fly balloons over the desert. So my risk factor is off to the right, or potentially yeah. I'm a and I've got uh, two ADA, and I really don't want to lose it. <laughs> probably, got, probably got three by now, Jared. Yeah, I'm curious what kind of gaming people are, are thinking of as well. Um, I mean, you could one sort of gaming it you might be thinking of is you know turning off your machine if you don't uh, need to have it on, so you can admittedly lose blocks. I I don't know if that would be a problem or not, or um, other sort of gaming it, I suppose you'd be thinking of would be um, re-registering a different pool um, if, I don't know. Right, because ultimately you probably, for the most part, want to make as many blocks as you can. I, I could see people turning off their machine between blocks, like if right. they were able to get the leader logs ahead of time to save right. costs. Yeah. Th that's not unreasonable. Yeah. Well, it's not unreasonable. Um, it's unreasonable for the network. But... Right. I just mean that that's the sort of gaming that makes sense to me. That you would uh, risk not making a block every once in a while for this. Yeah, saving resources on your compute. Yeah. You know? Another kind of gaming might be like, well, maybe you're just going to start a new pool over and over again because you know that everyone gives a bump to their estimation of new pools. So you just start a new pool and then don't do anything with it and people delegate to you. Right. I mean, that's true, Umed, but it's Umed saying, you know, you need to just tell people, hey, I'm still within 99%. That's true, but over time, uh, in the long run, that probability won't, sh I mean, if you're if you're consistently losing blocks that you should be, over time, that game's not going to play well. And that, got, that shows up in this Wilson. Um, sorry, I've got Wil Wilson something. I've got, gone what it is. Yeah, your variance will shrink over time. Yeah. Right. So, so a, a new pool operator could say that. 
a, a pool operator that's been there a long time can't say that to the same extent. So it's a kind of consistency measure that you're calculating. That's right. Yeah, you totally could. Yeah, I, I do tend to lean towards having some type of question to ask the user about their risk profile. I think that's very common in the world of investing. You know, are you high risk, medium risk, low risk? And then tweak the results they get based on that and let them play with it. Yeah. So uh, Umed, it seems like you're interpreting the confidence interval as being per pool. Uh, but it's probably going to be per user. So one user looks yeah, at pool rankings, pool rankings at like 80% confidence, another looks at 90% confidence or whatever. Oh yeah, and the confidence interval changing on the, so you're, yeah, so maybe the confidence interval should change depending on the age of the pool. That's what this whole song and dance is about is managing pools that have been around different lengths of time and exhibiting that in the variance. And then choosing between the histograms where when you have to make a decision is exactly picking how much variant, you know, what your tolerance is on the variance. Oh, yes, but I thought we'd have some standard. Yes, there Daedalus will have to have, make a decision about this stuff unless there's a toggle, which we certainly wouldn't do that. Um, right out the gates. Yeah, Mike is asking about um, recording actual performance. So you can yep. send information. I mean, that gives you better confidence, higher confidence in the quality of the information you're getting, right, Jared? Yeah, the ledger state saves the um, saves the most recent blocks for every pool, may, or maybe even saves two. I mean, th there's the snapshot. Um, we don't save it more than three epochs, I think. Yeah, more than three epochs now. Um, a user could probably save that over time if they wanted to. The, it's all in the chain. I don't think it's exposed right now in the API, but um, that's certainly something we could do so that people could look at the raw data, just blocks produced and stake and do whatever they want. That's totally viable. I think I could lie, couldn't I, with portals? I could, Can't I just say, I've got this tip from my pool and just send that to you, Mike. So I can, I can basically fake your protocol. And if I'm following along portals, I can manually feed data in that says, oh, I've got a really great pool. True. So you need yeah, that's, way to that's what we're doing right now is we're having them send in their slots and then we confirm the slots at the end of the epoch. So um, then we can validate that what they said 10 was what they actually had in their leader logs. Right. So we're kind of comparing actual leader logs, you know, as they forecast what they actually produce, which gives us a closer approximation to actual performance. I was just curious what you guys thought about that. I mean, now it's a, it's a centralized concept, um, which is bad, um, but it, it does seem to me like it gives a really good gauge of actual performance. Uh, so we still have the, the problem of converting uh, historical data in a prediction about the future, right? Right. And it still needs to reflect the the difference between like here's one where we have a lot of data and we can make a we can be pretty sure of our prediction, and here's one where we have less data and it's a you know less certain prediction. But, but as a principle, I think I think what the service you're providing, Mike, is is great. And um, so we we use it. We've been following along what you've been doing on the ITN and uh, using your metrics. Uh, in, internally to judge our own reports, our own test pools, for example. So having having the data available is, is great. And obviously, uh, I think in one central source is, you know, having one single set central source maybe goes against the decentralization primitive, but having allowing anyone to gather the information seems to be entirely decentralized. So as long as you can have multiple sources of information, that, that seems good to me.
In terms of uptime, no, we don't take uptime into account. We're just guessing based on, we're just predicting performance based on what blocks are produced. There's no way to know uptime. Could you know uptime by looking at the relays that a pool publishes on the blockchain? Uh, th none of that. We don't save any of that state to the the state of the ledger. It doesn't. Yeah, but any. that's that's, that's maybe point. something Mike Mike could collect. Um, can you know, if you publish publish your relays, and then he could check to make sure they're up. I guess. So we trust him then. No, yeah. can't node metrics collect that data though? We we could save this stuff to the state if we wanted. Well, it, it seems to me like uh, that would make more sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly something we could track. Um, it'd take more, more thought. I mean, that to me, that's the the number one thing that we're trying to prevent is people shutting their machines off in between. We want a hundred percent uptime, right? We want people to make the blocks they're supposed to. <laughs> right. Yes, but if you're if you're cycling your machine, if you're cycling your node, right. uh, there's a reduced chance that you're going to be able to do that, right? So, For sure. Well, I mean, if I can say, ultimately, block production will reflect the uptime uh, because that's a function of, of your uptime. And, and there's no reason to, to track something that's in between and it's just basically wasted data. I mean, th that's the hope is that this is good enough to, good enough to exactly do that. That's right. If, if you really are doing that, you know, maybe it's not causing harm. If, but if it is causing harm, then we should be able to notice that. I mean, the, the thing is with this is that people could, could game the system and say, look at my relays. They've been up all the time, but you could be switching off your pools and doing all sorts of right. stuff. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's why I say it would require more thought. Did we get all the questions? So uh, I think uh, it doesn't make much sense to switch off the pools because if you run like two or three or more relays, uh, like the cost advantage is not really there. So I don't see the point. I mean, that's the other hope too, is that we're talking about such a trivial amount of money for a lot of effort. But, you know, you guys would know <laughs> probably more than I would. I mean, my biggest concern would be to, to portray that as, as performance, whereas right. the actual performance would be block production. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. Um, block production is number one, and but and and definitely, you know, you, I don't think that you're saving up, you know, a, a ton of money by 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 doing this by shutting off some machines, but I think that uh, you know people are still going to try all of these things, you know, so I would rather have hard data to, to view, you know, but I, you know, it would totally be interesting for someone to track that data and, you know, report on it and let us know, you know, it does it, you know, is there any places where uptime is meaningful compared to what we calculate here? And if I may make an F, uh, you know, a comment about the risk tolerance, um, and I, mean, I come from the investment sort of background, and, and it's completely, you know, I understand Andrew when he says that the investment side basically uh, tracks those numbers. But in, in this particular case, it's, it's a very interesting thing because the, uh, the probability distribution is known ahead of time. It's governed by the algorithm. We know what we're going to have if we perform. You mean by yeah. per, per per stake pool, but I don't know what you have, but you know you. But I yes, don't. Know. But, yes, but if if I have let's say X percent of the stake, I'm expected to produce X number of blocks, and if there's a huge deviation between that, then there's a problem in performance. Um, and from the point of view of a uh, stake um, 
delegator, um, everybody would have to actually have a high risk tolerance in the beginning, as you were mentioning in the beginning, that if your blocks are there's right. few blocks, or if your pool is small, the deviation is going to be higher. Mm -hmm. uh, and if your pool is large, or if you've been with uh, you know blockchain for a long time, then you basically have a smaller deviation. Um, so uh, I don't know how to sort of interpret this because in the long run, everything should smooth out with, for the smaller pool or the larger pool. Um, it's just that the, the uh, variation is going to be higher in the beginning uh, for all the pools or uh, and you know, beginning of the, uh, you know, uh, not test net, but uh, the main net or the beginning of the life cycle of a pool uh, where it's small. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I don't know. I mean, that's just, that is the problem. And this is, this is our solution to it. I, I, I guess you could basically say, hey, you know, you're picking a pool that will have a higher standard deviation. Um, you know, are you comfortable with uh, not, you know, like not having a, a return for three or four epics? Yes, I mean, you could, if you're sophisticated, you can always dive into the details. So you can always dive into the detailed statistics, I, I, I guess. But we're, we're talking here about the average dataless user who, who probably wouldn't be that sophisticated. So maybe an observation I've made uh, on the test net. So um, there's a lot of variation in the, in the block assignment. So uh, I had like uh, at least one situation where my pool was very lucky and it had uh, just my own stakes, a million, and so it was uh, very highly ranked. And within a week, uh, people came and it uh, got an established pool. So there's also this luck factor. And then on the other hand, you get uh, like one or two weeks with very low uh, or with very bad luck. and. Uh, it it um, kind of settles down, but in I've seen so you can get some kind of a moonshot if you are getting lucky uh, and and achieve some very high uh, ranking, especially with these uh, uh, low stake pools uh, initially. What, what ranking so, are you talking about right now? Because this what Alex is describing is not being used in the friends and family test note. But Pool Tool has some um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, similar yeah, yeah. measures. So, and, <laughs> and I think people look at that. Yeah, so it, it's probably subject worse to this variation. <laughs> I mean, that's probably exactly what's going on, is it's not handling this variation very well. Mm. Yeah, so, so this approach is partly, partly just to combat that, that kind of uh, huge sensitivity, the small amounts of data. Yeah, pool tool doesn't actually rank anyone right now. Um, but the I know that the Dallas has some kind of ranking system in it, or the wallet does anyway. And I know uh, Pegasus includes that in their stuff in their app. Um, so maybe that's what you're referring to. Yeah, would you uh, do you have something on how we're giving the ranking information, Alex? I, we interrupted you when you were partway through your. Uh... Probably through your presentation. Oh no, I, I I shared everything that I have written down here. So I can, I can expand on that a bit because yeah, what Alex yeah at the top Alex mentioned there's a lot of moving parts to this and this is one of them. This is just performance. Have you all, have you guys are aware of this sort of non myopic reward stuff? Maybe maybe not. So I'll explain it different uh, briefly. So there's a problem with, um, so we want to allow for new pools with uh, competitive cost and margin pledge, all these different things that might make a, a pool desirable. There's a, a problem with just looking at exactly how much stake they have right now. Um, it, uh, there's a, one of Agalos' uh, PhD students wrote, I think is doing her old PhD thesis on the sort of game theory involved in this. And, uh, but she she calls doing that, looking at the stake distribution now and looking at people's cost and margin now is a sort of myopic 
short-sighted way of looking at the data. So, um, and it tends towards bad behavior. If people are acting in their own self-interest, using that as data, they make bad decisions. And, uh, you know, either you end up not being decentralized or other problems. So the solution to that is assume every pool has essentially saturated their pool. Now rank them based on their pledge, their cost, their uh, margin, do all of that. Calculate everyone's rewards based on all the pools being saturated, then adjust by this apparent performance, um, and now pick. Now, now pick, and so you're sort of, you're imagining that every pool could potentially gather enough delegation, uh, no, enough delegators to reach saturation. Who would I really want in the long term? And this is sort of the non-myopic view. But we do care about performance. So it's this whole discussion is just about adjusting that non-myopic um, outlook. I don't know if that was too fast, but. <laughs> a very quick explanation of a very complicated um, topic, Janet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, cool. Um, in fact, oh, and there's, it's written a lot better than I can do. Go ahead. Chris says he got it. He says it's a good explanation. That's awesome. And if you want to read more, um, I can point you guys, or maybe you guys have seen the delegation design document. It's not the formal spec. Um, but the one with lots of prose in it, um, written by Philip, Duncan, and um, Lars. It has a great section on the non-myopic rewards. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and it, it explains it really well. Um, and then we could also try to dig up uh, Katarina's uh, research paper too. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's the gist. And if you want more, I can point you at the at the actual research. And I should say none of this was done on the ITN. So if you're used to the, um, yeah, so this is stuff that's going to be new to these test nets. <laughs> Thanks, Umed. <laughs> By the way, Umed, I watched the um, the uh, podcast you did, the Cardano effect. That was really, really well explained. I was, it was so exciting to see our research so well explained to everybody on the internet. Uh, because, you know, it's like you see confusion and you want to, like, try to help, but, like, you totally did it. That was awesome. <laughs> Share it on the forum. Is the forum um, Telegram? No, no, the forum is longer lived. Okay. Yeah, I have to confess, I haven't been able to keep up with Telegram. It's past my uh, information. I can absorb right now. We don't blame you. We've had that feedback from a few people. <laughs> I'm to just tip in now, actually. Sorry for being a um, oh, yes. witness. Uh, <laughs> thanks to everybody for sending this. I hope you found it uh, useful. I, I'm, I, a lot of great feedback, I'm sure. Um, I'm just going to chip in and just give everybody a very brief update on what's going to be happening next week. And I think the forum is one of those things. So we will be opening up the test net to the public on Tuesday. Um, and part of that will also be opening up the forum. Um, so we really want that to sort of become the main discussion board, I suppose, for the project. I think some people will obviously use the stake pool operators best practice channel, I imagine, as the kind of the de facto instant messaging kind of medium as we head into the public phase. But equally, we recognize that that forum is a nice way for people to have an archive they can search already. So anything that's on there already will be open to the public going forwards from Tuesday. Um, so we're also going to be making the faucet available for everybody on the website ready for Tuesday. Um, it probably will be available if you're going to have a look on Monday evening, but I didn't tell you that. Um, and we're going to publicize it on Tuesday. And that will allow you guys with API keys to uh, draw down large amounts of ADA. And everybody who doesn't have an API key will get a small limited amount. Uh, which they'll be able to draw down. But of course, if anybody asks you for additional ADA, then please feel free to be generous. You have your API key, so you can always go and top yourselves up. Uh, but please don't share that API key, otherwise we might find people start draining the faucet and it all becomes a bit uncomfortable. So yeah, lots of stuff uh, happening early stage of next week. Um, forum opening up to the public, faucet opening up to the public. Hopefully the staking calculator also opening up. Thank you to anybody who's given their feedback so far. We'd certainly like to hear any more views you might have on that. And there is a link on that. Hopefully you've seen over on the forum. So yeah, going to be a busy couple of days next week. We're all on track for the public test net. 
so expect an onslaught of questions and thanks as ever for uh, for helping steer everybody in the right direction that's all i really had to say kevin thanks thanks Tim. and uh, jared and um, alex and, and various other people will be hanging around on the forum so we'll be getting people in to answer uh, any technical questions yeah how oh crit yeah the topology question with the public test net. tim do you want to answer that one actually sam, gonna, yeah sam. i was gonna say that's probably a sam one that's sam sam you're here yes i am here I actually didn't know about this meeting. I saw it on Telegram because I read all the messages on Telegram, unlike everybody else. <laughs> You're better than me, Sam. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Jared. <laughs> OK, what did you want me to address? It's the plan for the topology. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so what I'm thinking of doing, basically, currently we have the um, people's relays in a static file that we maintain outside of the um, Git repo. But what I'm thinking about doing is committing that to the Git repo and then just letting people pull requests if they want to change to the topology. Um, and then my team would basically review those requests and merge them. Um, hopefully we don't have thousands of people asking for their nodes to be added to the topology uh, on day one. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I'm going with that. Um, I did do a poll in Telegram um, yesterday, and I'm going to scroll back here and check on the results of that, uh, basically asking um, how comfortable people were with their relays uh, being made public in our um, repository. Um, it seemed pretty split, almost 50-50 when I checked last. But one of these days, my scroll wheel is going to get up to uh, where the poll is, and I will know right. what the current results are. Well, what we what we thought we could do, Sam, is, is if there's a private sub topology like the one that Marcus has been maintaining, uh, that could then all you have to do is link Marcus's relay off to the IUHK topology, and instantly all those nodes are connected, right? That is true. So if people don't want to be in the IOHK topology um, and they just want an extra hop, um, they can give their relay to um, Marcus and then that's in a private gist, I think, where that's maintained. So you, you do have options here. Anything else to add, Sam? Um, I guess I probably shouldn't just copy paste everyone's into the repo. So probably what I'm going to do is create a skeleton file today and people can pull requests if they want to be in the IOHK topology. Great. And then, yeah, uh, friends and families back up, faucets up. Um, I believe it's up to like 200 million or something available in the faucet right now. Oh no, 903 million is available in the faucet right now. So plenty of UTXOs if people want to start pulling them down, getting their pools registered. Um, and then are we in the new epoch yet? Uh, sorry, I'm a little groggy. I have not been sleeping very well the last couple of days. <laughs> not too surprising, Sam. Too many bears. Yeah. Nope, we're not in the new epoch yet, but um, that should be starting. Let's see, that was one when I kicked it off. So one plus six, seven. It's now five UTC. So about two hours, it looks like, I think, um, uh, pools will start making blocks. So it'll probably just be the IOHK ones for that first epoch, because I don't think anyone else got funds unless someone else was um, sharing funds with people. Um, but the epoch after that, all your pools should start making blocks. Um, I have the decentralization parameter at 0.75 right now. I will leave it there until we have at least 10 pool, pools um, making blocks. Um, and then um, at that point, I will um, drop it down to uh, 0 0.5 where we were before. 
And then once we get up to 50 pools making blocks, um, I'll drop it down to 0 0.25. And then um, maybe next week we'll go crazy and drop it down to zero and completely re uh, decentralize the thing and see how things go. Yeah, we can, we can also play around with the K and A0 and other parameters, right, Sam? Yes, if you want any of those, if you have any suggestions at what you think those should be, if you don't like what they currently are, uh, talk to uh, Kevin, and um, Kevin will uh, take your suggestions under consideration and uh, give me a new list of things to change them to. Absolutely. So see, we're at 6, six o'clock, which is when we said we would finish. Uh, there's one question about uh, P2P implementation. Uh, Jared, you've been following that, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, David, yes, we can change K and A0 uh, every epoch. We just have to do it early enough, right, Sam, in the so we yes. can parameter update. Depends which K you mean. The, the one they know about. Oh. Number yeah. of pools. Number okay. of pools. Cool. Don't, don't, don't confuse people, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> K was a very bad choice for that particular parameter. Yeah, Except I would. Yeah. Yeah. I say we don't call it K ever. Too late. Okay. The community calls it K, so oh, it's the K. I tried to call it in opt for in optimal in the Shelly spec, but even that's probably too short. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Needs, needs to be careful. Yeah, so, so there's a question about the peer-to-peer -peer implementation. So from who raised that. Now, I don't know if we have anyone from consensus on here. No, we, we, we no. haven't. Uh, but the, um, the current, so it's, it's something that we can maybe address in a, you know, another one of these sessions, maybe tell you how things are, go, are going to work, because it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, but the current state of play is that we've been doing some implementation uh, and we're just filtering through the different priorities. Uh, so the different aspects to the P2P, um, full P2P governors are, I think, unlikely to make it before we get a main match release, the window's quite tight. But it's, it's definitely something that we see as, as important for sure. Yeah, any other important questions? So something about help with the exercises? Chris, you said, Tim, hash errors, hash X, hash help, hash important. What did you I'm mean? Not sure if Chris has been kidnapped and that's his secret cry for help, but. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> So, so what do you mean, Chris? You want to, you need help, or you or other people need? Chris, Chris was uh, Chris was suggesting that we start using hashtags to improve searchability in Telegram. Oh, he was okay. suggesting those are maybe those are maybe four. I was I was wondering whether we try and almost encourage people when they're talking about a particular exercise to include a hashtag as a way of people being able to search on an exercise. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think delineating in any other way might be a bit more challenging because people won't necessarily whether something is important or not is a fairly subjective decision isn't it um but yeah maybe we can regroup on that kevin and maybe try and identify a single hashtag for each of your exercises so at least if people choose to use that they can search on it absolutely good good idea chris i thought you we were calling for help there <laughs> i don't um, good um, criteria would be for you know what's what will make it easier for you all to find problems and issues that sort of thing well you're doing you're doing a great job so far so you you are you are right yeah yeah sure yeah. i mean there might be there might be a layer based thing as well we could incorporate in there so particular components or particular layers that that people want to flag maybe i don't know i mean at the end of the day the, I mean, that's how, that's how I use Telegram is, you know, if I get stuck, I search for an error message, you know, so I'm thinking about 
if you all uh, want to get a high level overview of problems that people are having, that might be an easier way to uh, to get there. Uh, separate topic, free check size on the forum. Yes, that's a nice idea. Yeah, yeah. there's even a proposal to um, build a formal course. I think Tim, am I giving anything away? But no, there's about four proposals to build formal courses, so we'll end up with one at least. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, one of the other things that's been suggested was some sort of Stack Overflow type set up within the forum as well, so that the most popular stuff will float to the top. I need to talk to the CF about that and whether that's achievable within our current format settings, but that's another idea that's been mooted recently on that, just FYI. Yeah, so, so we quickly close off uh, Umet's question about whether you're going to find out the K and A zero values. Uh, yes, we will make those available to you. I can't give you an exact uh, time scale for that, but soon. And what you've got to bear in mind is the values that are chosen, uh, there will be initial values uh, that we'll use to get the network up and running. And obviously, they're going to evolve over time. And at this, this point in time, we can't tell whether they're going to be 100, 500, 1,000, 10,000 balls running on the main net. And of course, depending on the number, you may need different parameter settings. We, we've, got, we've got good ideas, and we're, uh, we've got a lot of input. We've been, as, as you know, collecting information from you about things like the cost of running a pool. That's very important. Uh, we've been doing risk analyses on our side, and we will take rational decisions on all these parameters, as, as well as all the technical ones. So the, it, it, there are about, what is it, 25 parameters that have to be set, Sam and Jared all together. And a lot of them are just technical ones. Um, some of them are sort of business ones like K and A0. Yeah, I can't keep track of them all. I have them written down, but. <laughs> I can well, show I'm folks where they are in the specs if they're curious. <laughs> that's right. We, there, there's a spreadsheet which is tracking all of these. And mm -hmm. when, when we went through them, I think there were about 25 of them that we that we chose parameter settings for, in, including KES rotation and sound, right? Yeah, there's things like the deposit sizes and um, yeah, there's a whole slew of things. Great. Yeah, there's tons of parameters. <laughs> the sale. the Kes rotation any any of the Kes rotation ones um, are fixed they're not actual adjustable so it needs a new genesis if we want to change any of those um, yeah that's correct but uh, if you if you do um, Cardano CLI Shelly Query protocol parameters that will list all the protocol parameters and I believe all those that are listed in the protocol parameters can be updated by an update proposal. So that's not that does not list any of the global constants, right? Okay, cool. That's great. Is there a way to list the global constants? I don't think so. I don't think so. So what we should probably do is is um, put something like that spreadsheet up so people can see all these constant values. And the situation is that uh, a lot of these technical parameters, the ones you're playing around with at the moment. We don't, we don't see any good reason to change them going forward. Uh, the, things like K and A0, of course, we see reasons to change them. Has there been any discussion about um, epic length so far? J Jared, do you want to say, say anything here? Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember now what the, um, did, uh, did we decide on 10K over F? I think they're more concerned about the number of days. So, so five, oh, I think days, I, five days, right? It would be, I think, I think we're keeping it at five days and one second slots. Yeah. I, I, um, I mentioned the possibility of changing it, uh, to Duncan and he almost, he almost coughed out his tea. 
yeah. I think it's I think it's foolish to change it from five days myself. But did you mention that uh, it, the the slot time is going to change from twenty seconds to one second? I did, but but keep in mind that um, that that means that's a possibility of a slot. We um, do, do. Are you familiar with the active slot coefficient? Slot coefficient. Yes. Right. So that would that would mean that we would expect on average a slot every twenty seconds, but technically it's a second. Yeah. Okay. So that's way that should be how it is on the internet right now. So that that's way of reducing the certainty of the leader schedule, right, Jared? Is that double Yeah. Yeah, the um, active slot coefficient is a way of tuning uh, how often you have uh, slot uh, collisions. And on, on that note, um, has there been have have we had any discussion about um, um, computing the leader leader schedule and uh, and, and in advance and that that type of thing? Oh, like uh, providing a tool so that a uh, so that the stake pools can see their leader uh, schedule in advance. Well, they're like on on the ITN, Jormungander um, right, right. computes the leader schedule at block zero, right? But uh, SL, my or not SL, Cardano node, my understanding or the way I see it is that the node is constantly polling to see if it's leader for the next slot. If uh, if am I correct? Um, yeah, so it, it's an issue. Yeah, I, that's something that we could provide. Um, it just has to do the calculation with its VRF key. It's got to check every slot and see am I the leader or not. And I, I think what's going on is it's doing it slot by slot right now. And we don't compute for the whole epic and then expose that. Um, but yeah, with the VRF yeah, with the key. VRF. Yeah, and I guess that that's exactly the question. Is there any intention or plan to compute in advance or is the plan to leave it that way so that uh that's kind of a more of a incentive to leave your your node up oh, oh technically i could tell you how to do it right now it's it, the information's there it's just not you need you you could do it with your vrf key the slot and the epoch nonce uh and then there's one other um number you could just do that calculation and you could check yourself, but we just want to make it easy. Perhaps, we could, perhaps we could take that offline. That'd be great. Cool. It sounds like someone's going to be producing a tool to do this, Jared. That's what, that's what needs to happen. Yeah. And it's a super good idea. It's just, there's not a tool for it. Yeah. Right. But by the end, I think you might have a volunteer to do it for you. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah, no, that would be great. Yeah, I agree for maintenance. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Great. So has has everyone managed to ask the questions they want? Anyone not ask any questions? Okay, so so th thank you very much, Alex and Jared. Also also Tim and Tim and Sam for joining one, in. One final note from me, just very just a heads up. So we haven't started publicizing this, this yet, guys, but um, on Thursday, we'll have a, a hangout, which will be fully open to any stake pool operator who wants to join. Um, it will really be a chance after we've kind of opened the doors on Tuesday and people have had a quick look at the documentation and the exercises. It'll be a quick chance for people to come on and kind of ask questions and get a steer if they need anything. And obviously, as pioneers, you've got your own guys you're mentoring. Um, feel free to join that. As I say, mainly it's for brand new stake pool operators, but you're all uh, you're all very welcome. And that's going to be on Thursday around the same time as this session was today. Uh, time to be confirmed, but just a heads up on that. That will also start being publicised next week. Thanks.